right outside the door here in the little garden area that connects those two sidewalks, you will see a marker stone. It's this one. And it has on it a plaque uh, that says, Woodland Baptist Church established 1965. Uh, that is set there so people don't forget. How many of you have ever been to a, a cemetery? Okay. And you see the headstones or the markers. Why are those set there? So people won't forget. I remember one time uh, we were uh, in Maryland and we were on a hunt for dead relatives. Any, ever, any of you ever been on a hunt for dead relatives? They're, they're sometimes easier to find than living relatives. But uh, we were on a hunt for dead relatives. My mom was going through the genealogy of her family and it, it took us to Emmitsburg, Maryland. And they said that we had stopped at several places. And somebody said, well, yeah, there's a, the old cemetery out in Farmer So-and-So's field. So, so we go out there, and it's just a, it's a, just a giant field. It's plowed up. Uh, it's furrowed. But out in the middle of the field, probably several hundred yards away, was this giant grove of trees. And my mom sends me out trespassing on this uh, farmer's property uh, to see what's in the trees. And I get it. I mean, these are 100, 100, 200 year old oak trees, beautiful trees. And they plowed all around it. Uh, so I get into the grove and lo and behold, there's a cemetery in the mix of all of these trees and bushes and shrubs all overgrown and and uh, uh, most of the headstones are unreadable and knocked down. But in fact, it was the old family cemetery for my mom's uh, side of the family in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And I got to hunt through them and find the few that, that she was looking for. Uh, we found that connection. We found that connection to our past, to, to our lineage, to our heritage, something that was substantial enough to say, yes, in fact, it must be true. This is where we come from. Well, that's why people put cornerstones in buildings and they put marker stones on properties so that in years gone by or yet to go, people can come back and say, this is where... I came from. This is where my family was. This is, this is where I grew up. This is, this is a part of me. See, but none of that makes any, any sense at all unless we recognize that we are together connected in Christ. If we are not connected in Christ, it's just an old weathered headstone. Or an old weathered cornerstone or an old weathered marker stone. And it means nothing. Because it is in Christ and Him as our cornerstone that makes us a part of the bigger picture of the family of God. To find those headstones in Emmitsburg helped us connect to family long passed away. To recognize our connected in Christ helps us to find family all across the, the globe, living and dead and even yet to be born. And that's really what Paul is talking to the Ephesian church about. He's directing this particularly to the Gentile community in Ephesus. And, and we're going to do a little back study here. We're going to go back to verse 11. And he's going to say there, Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision. Okay, He's saying, remember that you were formerly not a part of this family. You were not a part of the people of God. You were called uncircumcised unaccepted, Gentile, separated, different, not like us. 
You were, were not apart. Remember, you were not apart. Remember in verse 12 that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. You were excluded and separated and far away. But then in verse 13 he says, but now in Christ, and we should have that highlighted or bold printed or underlined in our Bible, but now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of God. How many of you remember dating your soon-to-be-married uh, partner and uh, it came up to that discussion of having to go meet their family? Now, some of you have known each other's families for a long time, so that wasn't a big deal. But, but for those of you who did not know the other family, okay, that could be a very anxious-provoking or anxiety-provoking time. Well, would they like me? What will they say? Will I be accepted? What if I make a fool of myself? They're going to judge me. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what happens. Okay? And the judgment is to keep you far away or to bring you near. And in loving families, hopefully, because you're in love with their son or their daughter, regardless of how they might feel about you, they bring you near. And they say, because you love our son, because you love our daughter, we love you. You know, we may not really like you yet. We love you. What Paul is saying is, it is in Christ that you Gentiles were brought near or into relationship with the nation of God. Israel, in a sense, uh, because much of the church was Jewish in nature, so, so that analogy works where Paul's using it at this point in time, okay? That you were brought near through Christ and his sacrifice. And verse 15 and 16 talks about just how near where he goes by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. In Christ, through the cross, we who were far and different were brought in to be one. We were made one through Christ. That's so important for us to remember. That... It doesn't matter how we look. It doesn't matter what we wear. It doesn't matter where we come from. What matters is that Jesus is in our heart and that we agree to love each other wholly and completely as God loves us. Does that mean that, that you're going to connect and, and click with everybody you come across? No, it doesn't. Does that mean that, that everybody who comes into the church is, is going to be your kind of people? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean that they are your brothers and sisters in Christ and come what may, you've got to love them and support them and walk with them and allow them to walk with you through the trials and tribulations, through the wonderful successes and joys of life. That's what it means to be connected in Christ. But that's a hard pill to swallow for some of us. See, verse 17 and 18, Paul goes on to say that Jesus brought two very different peoples together and made them one people. And sometimes that can be uncomfortable to have, to have everything and everybody come together all into this big melting pot 
And out of all these different things, it makes something totally new and unique. It said, He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Jesus brought the same message to the Jew and the Gentile alike. He brings the same message to the cheerleader and the football player and the nerd and the computer geek. Same message. It's a message of love and acceptance. And I, I guess things probably haven't changed much. In my high, high school, the nerds and the geeks didn't hang out with the football players and the cheerleaders. And sometimes we find that happening in the church. That, that people begin to separate themselves into groups and cliques and, and, and specialty areas. And, and God say, no, no, we need to come together because He came and He preached peace to those who are far away and to those who are near. To make us one. For through Him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Well, I got one telephone and we all need to share it together. It takes me back to college. Living in the dorm. There's one pay phone out in the middle of the hall. And on certain days, especially toward the end of the month, when all the kids had run out of money, there was a line by that phone and we all had to wait our turn to call our father. Say, Dad, running short of cash. Can you send... Next month's check out a little bit early. Everybody was calling Dad. We got one phone. And that's a direct connection to heaven. And although we don't have to stand in line to use it, we're all talking to the same guy. And he knows our hearts and he knows our needs and, and, and he knows our failings as well as our passions. And he knows what you're up to and he knows what I'm up to. And he knows what you need and he knows what I need. And we need to take our call to him knowing that he's going to minister to me in a myriad of different ways. And then I have a responsibility through Christ to minister as well. And he might use you to minister to me. And he might use me to minister to you. And he might use somebody that you don't particularly connect with to minister to you. Or he may ask you to step out on faith and get out of your comfort zone and reach out to somebody you don't necessarily connect with. But we're all one happy family. We should be. So we should be able to do that. I was talking in Sunday school today about how there were days that my brother and I hated each other. But we lived under the same roof and we had to get along. You know, 13 year old can't say, I'm moving out. I don't like my brother anymore. I'm moving out. I'm, I'm out of here. No, you gotta make it work. And he's, he's my brother, so I love him, you know, but I'm gonna beat the heck out of him later on when mom and dad are gone. <laughs> but that's what family is. See, uh, Paul in verse 19 says that we're no longer foreigners. What is a foreigner? What comes to mind when you think of foreigners? I think of, of the, the early uh, pre-industrial, industrial age in the United States when people came from all over the world to be a part of what was happening in the United States of America. Things were tough in their country, so they came here to, to get a leg up and, and to make a difference and to make something of themselves. But there was a problem with what happened with that immigration influx. What happened was the Italians came in and they moved to the Italian side of town. And the Irish came in and they moved to the Irish side of town. And the Polish came in and they moved to the Polish side of town. And if you were Polish and you lived in the Polish side of town, you weren't hiring an Irishman or an Italian or a Native American. So as much as we, we had this grand idea of being one, what did we do? We separated ourselves again. 
And, and that happens now. You buy your first house in a nice little neighborhood. You and your husband with maybe one, one little kid and, you know, you're, you're making it. And, and then you get a big raise or a big promotion and you move to the next neighborhood. And then the next neighborhood. And then the next neighborhood. Okay? What happened to all those friends you had in those other neighborhoods? Well, some of them moved along with you. Okay? Some of them stayed behind. But the point is, do we stay connected with those friends or do we leave them just because we've one up them? We have to recognize that there are bigger things than houses and jobs and nationalities and cultures that pull us together. And for us as Christians, it's Christ. So we were foreigners... And then we became citizens. We were aliens. That's even a, a bigger step out, isn't it? Okay. The foreigners from New York City and aliens from Wisconsin. <laughs> if they talk different or they eat different foods, you know, then, then they just assume be E.T., Alien is that next step back. It, it's so different than you're used to that it becomes very uncomfortable for you. You know, churches like to do things one way and, and they get in a, in a routine that then becomes a rut, that then becomes a habit, that then becomes a tradition. And all of a sudden, young people come in and and kids are running around, or different music's playing, or, or somebody says, hey, we should paint the sanctuary pink. And those with tradition say, they're aliens. No human being would want a sanctuary pink. They've got to be from outer space. But what has to happen is those with tradition need to pull in the pinkies and say, you know what? We can do it together. Let's just do eggshell. <laughs> That's a step out of our comfort zone. We like just plain white, okay? But we'll negotiate to eggshell, which is a little off of pink, and we'll both start moving to the metal. You know, we did something up in the children's uh, wing. Most of you have been up there, and you see the wonderful murals and the two-toned wall. Um, you know, if you'd have asked some people before the children's committee, you know, did that, they'd say, oh, that, that'll be horrible. Two colors on the same wall? You're putting stickers on the wall? But it, when it was completed, people went in of all ages and went, wow, that's really neat. Wow. That's not what I imagined it was going to be. Stepping out of our comfort zone into something maybe alienish becomes something wonderful when we do it together. And we recognize that maybe our way isn't always the best way. And every once in a while, maybe our, our way is the best way. And coming together as a community in Christ, we're able to do that. Even though we might be aliens... And foreigners, we have been brought together as one in Christ Jesus. Verses 19 and 20 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. Basically, what Paul is saying is that God has torn up your foreign passport and issued you a passport to heaven. You are now just the same as everybody else with that passport. Well, that's what happens in citizenship. People who are from a foreign country and, and come to America and want to be part of Amer America, they have to renounce their old allegiances and claim allegiance to the United States of America. And in so doing that and going through the process and, 
and, and, and, and making the pledge, they become United States citizens, and they are issued a new passport, basically. Well, that's what Paul is saying here. He says that we have become citizens with God's people and members of his household. God's house. Now, what's so special about God's house? It is the one that's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and has Christ as the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is the foundation stone, is the marker stone, is, is the headstone, is the announcement to the world, and, and the, the part of the building that secures and locks everything else together, it is Christ. And that's the house that God built. And he's invited us to come and to be a part. Seventeen hundreds, people have been uh, settling America from Europe for close to a hundred years, maybe. Okay. And we have begun to knit ourselves together as a community of people, all very different, yet with with sensibilities of similarity that draw us to be one. In the preamble of the United States Constitution, it says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain to establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Those founding fathers came together, appointed by their different states and republics and territories, to unite a divergent different people into one called the United States of America. That's such a beautiful picture of what God has done with the church. He has called men and women, young and old, from all different cultures, in all different languages, in all different realms across the globe, and He has brought them together under one constitution. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those of us who ascribe to to citizenship of God and heaven are one. We are one in Christ. Verse 21 says, In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. In Christ, everybody doing their part, everybody having their responsibility, everybody <coughs> taking care creates a beautiful structure. Human structure, spirit structure, and temporal church structure into what God wants us to be. And in verse 22, it says, And in Him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So he brings it back around to the Gentiles that he started to address in verse 11. And he said, you too, who once were far away and very different, are now personally related to God. Each of us are being built together, personally, corporately, spiritual, temporal, physical, through Christ, into who God wants us to be. But it is only through Christ that that can be accomplished. 
So when we talk about being connected in Christ, that is the linchpin to the, to the entire edifice, the entire church universal, the, the entire structure of Woodland Baptist Church, the entire Christian community. If you take Christ out of the equation, we become nothing that we are and become everything that everything else is already. Just another club. Just another meeting place. Just another building. Just another place to drop your kids off so you can get some time away. Just another place to meet your friends. When you remove Christ from the equation, we are no longer connected. So keep Christ first individually as well as corporately. And by doing that, and by resting in Him, our ability to make a difference across the world is greatly enhanced. Amen. Maybe some of you feel like an alien this morning. Like E.T. wanting to phone home. Get me out of here. Maybe some of you feel foreign, disconnected. Makes sense, but eh, not quite. Uh, some, some's being lost in translation. Then it's time to phone home and ask God to knit you in to his family. And yeah, there'll be there'll be sort of some new language to learn and some new habits and cultural things that are different than you're used to. But you will be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If there's one person here today who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, today's the day to connect with Christ. Say yes to Jesus. Yes, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I believe I have access to the Father because of what you're willing to give me. Maybe you say, you know what, I, I, I do need to get connected. I need to get plugged in here at Woodland. And make that commitment and make that choice and do it. God's laid it on your heart. Do it. Or whatever else God's laid on your heart. Let's stand together.